Hallelujah. All right, one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah is a wonderful, wonderful thing that's in all language. Whether you go to India, China, Africa, wherever, everybody says hallelujah. Amen. Because it's a heavenly word that glorifies God. All right, we're continuing our series on the gospel of Mark. Uh, if you're new to our church, we like to go through the books of the Bible verse by verse. And we've been studying for the last several, several months um, the gospel of Mark. And today will be in Mark chapter 11. Are you ready to hear, ready, excited to hear God's word? Amen. Now, Mark 11, which we're going to start today, starts a new section in the book of Mark. So far, we have covered the last 10 chapters of the gospel of Mark. And if you noticed, Mark moves really fast. The gospel of Mark is, a, compared to other gospels, it's like action-packed. One of the things that you read over and over in the gospel of Mark is what? Immediately. Immediately, immediately, right? So 10 chapters, for the last 10 chapters, Mark covers three and a half years of Jesus' life and ministry for 10 chapters. Okay. Now, starting in chapter 11 through the end 16, the next six chapters, Mark is going to focus on just one week of Jesus' life. Okay? So last 10 chapters covers... Three and a half years, pretty much the whole of Jesus' life and ministry. And the last six chapters, he comes really fast and then slows down. And he's going to spend six, next six chapters talking about the final one week of Jesus' life. And this is Mark's way of telling that this is what everything has been leading to. Everything that I've talked to you before leads to this. This is the consummation. This is the culmination of all that I have been talking to you. This final week in the life of Jesus. In our passage today, Mark 11, 1 through 11, Jesus finally enters the city of Jerusalem on what is called the Palm Sunday, right? Today's not a Palm Sunday, you know, in the church calendar, but we can celebrate Palm Sunday anytime, amen? And uh, so today, the passage is generally referred to as the Palm Sunday, that Jesus enters Jerusalem. And for a while, we've been talking, they've been traveling. And you've been saying, hey, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be arrested, and all these things he's been talking about. And the time is finally here, and we're going to, we'll see in the next several chapters. The timing of Jesus entering Jerusalem is significant because it reveals his purpose. He enters Jerusalem in the beginning of the Passover week. Passover was the annual celebration the Jews celebrated that literally hundreds and thousands of Jews from all over the world would congregate in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had the population probably at this time of 30 or 40,000. But during this time, hundreds and thousands of people will be gathered here and they will be sacrificing hundreds and thousands of Passover lamb to remember and celebrate God freeing their ancestors for a slavery after a slavery of 400 years. Okay. And God commanded them to do this. You can read that in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. God through Moses sets his people free through the shed blood of the lamb. Now, if you're new to church or new to Bible, we say, what's all this weird craziness, shed blood of the lamb and all these things, all right? Grab a Bible, read Exodus, Exodus 12, and you will get the whole picture. We don't, have, we don't have time, right? There is a Bible in front of you. That's the only thing you're allowed to steal from the church here, all right? Feel free. If you don't have a Bible, take it with you. Nobody would ask you a question. Keep it with you, all right? You have my permission. And go read Exodus 12. And Jesus, it talks about how God set his people free. The reason Jesus is entering Jerusalem on this first day of the Passover, on Palm Sunday, is because it's meant to show that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus, all the lamb that have been sacrificed for, for generations, for hundreds of years, this is what the, all the lambs that were sacrificed was pointing to. When John the Baptist saw Jesus for the first time, what did he say? He said, behold the lamb of God, who takes away what? The sin of the world. That's the first thing he said. Behold the Lamb of God 
that takes out the sin of the world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So Jesus enters Jerusalem on this Friday, uh, on this Palm Sunday, and on Friday, he would shed his blood for the sins of his people, to set his people free from the bondage and the slavery of sin. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Passover Lamb sent by God to pay the penalty for the sins of his people, right? So that's where we are in Mark. Right? Now we're going to, you know, all of this is one week of Jesus' life, and the next six chapters we'll be covering over, a, over quite a period of time. But today we'll be, we'll be looking at the Palm Sunday, which is verses 1 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, uh, Mark chapter 1. Start, uh, Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Okay. This is the first day of the Passover line, the first day of the Passion Week. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage, Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, a donkey, a little donkey, a little baby donkey, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? Why are you taking my donkey? And they said, and they, and they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. So Jesus here is asking his disciple to perform a donkey heist on his behalf. All right? He's going to go, go and get me a donkey. So Jesus following, so the disciples following Jesus' instruction, they go, they go to this neighboring village, and as Jesus has said, they found a donkey tied there, a little um, a youth donkey, a, a nice young donkey tied there. And so they go, and as Jesus has commanded, we're untying it, and lo and behold, somebody's the owner is there, where are you taking my donkey? And they go, the Lord needs it. He's like, oh, okay, take it. You should try that today. After the service, go and get a look outside in the parking lot, a nice car, and go and sit there and, and say, hey, what are you doing in my car? The Lord needs it. Give me your keys. Right. So this is very interesting. Okay. He, he just goes, go, and exactly what Jesus said happened. And I like the response of this owner of this donkey. Okay. He, he goes, why are you taking my donkey? The Lord needs it. He said, sure, take it. Right? It's a beautiful picture. I, most scholars believe this man knew Jesus and probably followed Jesus. Okay? And when he knew that Jesus needed his donkey, he didn't say, hi, it's my donkey. Go get another donkey. Right? He said, it's just Jesus need my donkey? Take it. He had an open-handed attitude with all of his position. And my brother says he's a good example. You know, to remember and to know that everything that we are and everything we have is from whom? God, right? Everything. So we don't go, hey, this is my car. I'm not going to get it. This is my house. This is my money. No. When God calls us to use our money, our possessions, our time, our talents, anything, we realize it's for God. And this guy's a good example. He said, the Lord needs it. Take it. Now, you may ask the question, how did Jesus know that there was a donkey in the neighboring village? And how did he know that the donkey would be there, and then, you know, this owner of the donkey would ask this question, and then he would say yes. How did he know that? My brothers and sisters, let's not forget who we are talking about. Who are we talking about? It's Jesus. Jesus knows every donkey in the world, right? Jesus knows everything. He knows everything. He is God. He's omniscient, the Bible says. So, you know, some people are, some people are trying to explain, maybe Jesus knew the owner, maybe all this thing. I don't think Mark, the way he says it, it's not. Jesus knew. Exactly, because he's God who knows every single detail. And he's the one who's orchestrating it. You know, the last one week was not an accident. It didn't take Jesus by surprise. He's been talking about this time. Jesus was not a murderer. It was not an accident. God orchestrated it. Jesus orchestrated it. Even here, you see, everything has been or orchestrated by the sovereignty of God. Now, another question is, why did Jesus ask his disciples to get a donkey? Okay. 
He's been walking for probably more than 40 miles already. And he's probably less than a mile or two from Jerusalem. Why is it at this point, they've been walking all this along, and when they get close to Jerusalem, why is he asking for a donkey? Is it that he's tired walking four miles and say, Here, guys, I'm tired. Let's get an Uber. Let's get a donkey. And let's get to Jerusalem. No. Why is it? There was a bigger purpose in Jesus using a donkey to enter Jerusalem. It's my brothers and sisters. It's because Jesus is finally going to go public with his identity. Now, if you remember through the book of Mark, every time, what did Jesus say? Do the miracles. Don't go and tell people. Keep it to yourself. He didn't want a big crowd to follow him and disrupt his ministry. So he revealed himself, his true identity of who he was, Messiah, not to crowd in general, but to his followers. And obviously the word would spread. People would still go to and the crowd would come around. And actually, as we talked about several, so long time ago, it would disrupt his ministry. So Jesus did not go and reveal his identity to the crowd. But here, in this final week, he is going to, the reason he's asked for a donkey and he's going to ride on a donkey into Jerusalem is to reveal his identity, that he is the promised Messiah that God promised. Matthew tells us in Matthew 21, 4, the parallel verse, Matthew's version of of the triumphal entry of the Palm Sunday, he says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And you say, which prophet? It was prophet Zechariah, okay, who prophesied 500 years ago before this happened. And what was his prophecy? It's, you can read it in Zechariah 9.9. It says, Ze Zechariah prophesied 500 years ago, around 500 years ago, that this day would happen. And how is going to happen? Zechariah 9, 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having a salvation. And having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is riding Jerusalem with a donkey because he's finally revealing his identity, saying, I am the one the prophets talked about, and I'm here. I am the king. I am the Messiah that Zechariah was talking about. And the Jews, what's interesting, the Jews who knew the scripture, because they knew, and they've been waiting for Messiah for a while. So Jews who saw, and John says, you know, in his version, that they heard about these, these, these pilgrims, or all those people who came for the, to celebrate the Passover, knew about Jesus. They had heard that, hey, there's this man who, who can raise the dead, who feeds thousands of people with five loaves and two fish, two fishes. And he does all these great things. And when they see somebody riding into a donkey, and they say, who is he? Isn't Jesus? And he's riding a donkey? So he must be the Messiah. So they were able to connect. He does all these great things, miraculous work, and claims to be from God. And we know that the Messiah is going to come on a donkey. And there is this guy coming on a donkey. And he has raised people from the dead. And he's done all this miraculous work. And they recognized that Jesus was what Zechariah was talking about. And so the next thing you know, the crowd went crazy. You read it about in verse 7, and they gave him this ceremonial welcome that they would do to a victorious king who would come into town. So when a, when a king is victorious, when king conquers, and the people say, hey, we are under you. We are your, please rule us. And that's a ceremony that we're going to read about in starting verse 7. It says, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. Okay, that it was not that they put their cloak on it to cover, to make it a little more comfortable for Jesus. And he sat on it. Verse 8, and many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he coming, 
coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So they're like, this is what God had promised. This is our Messiah. This is the one that, who's going to restore. He's in, in the line of King David. Blessed be the name of the, of the Lord. And they are they're coding the scriptures. And they're excited. And they, what they do, they take their cloaks. Right? And, put, and back in the day, it was expensive. They didn't have you know, so many cloaks lying around like we do, our clothes. They took their cloaks out and they laid it on the street as saying, is, is, it was their ancestral way of saying that rule over us, walk over us. You are the king. We bring yourself underneath your rule and authority because that's what people would do. When the conquering king comes, they say, hey, we submit to you. We are yours. Rule over us. They cut prime branches and put it on the street and shouted, Hosanna, which means what? Please save us. Hosanna, save us, save us. They are crying for salvation. And if you were there this morning, it will be like the morning that we were here. People are singing praises to Jesus, worshiping Jesus, and a great crowd celebrating Jesus as the king. And what they are doing, my brothers and sisters, they, is right. They are recognizing Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy. They are worshiping and praising him. And that's a good thing. And we are called to worship and celebrate. It's a wonderful thing when we come and worship Jesus loud so people know that we are excited about a king. This looks really good. And the way Mark portrays it, it's been building up and there's excitement and there's joy. And there's a sense that something's going to happen soon. And then you read verse 11. Let's read it. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. I mean, what just happened? There were people shouting, screaming, and there's a big celebration and worship going on. And it's just, next verse is just bizarre and very anticlimactic. It basically says, Jesus got into Jerusalem, hopped off his donkey, went into the temple, looked around, and said, boys, it's getting really late, let's go home. And went to Bethany. And you're going, what? What happened? Where did all the crowds go? Where's all, how is Jesus left by himself in and with his disciples? What happened to all those people who were following and shouting and praising and say, hey, we submit to you. You are king. Rule over us. What happened to that? Where did all the enthusiasm go? And so when you read, it's, you feel like building up and all of a sudden like, Everybody goes home. What happened here, my brothers and sisters? The crowd was very, the crowd recognized that when Jesus rode on donkey, that Jesus could be the Messiah. Jesus is the king. He, or he could be the king. But as we've looked through the gospel of Mark, People had a wrong understanding of what kind of king he will be. Remember? Even the disciples themselves. Jesus has told them over and over and over again, hey, I'm a different kind of king. I will die on the cross. I would be, it's not what you're expecting. And still what they were arguing about, remember? We talked to several times. Who's the greatest? Who's going to have the throne? Who's going to rule and reign with Jesus? And so this crowd, they're excited about Jesus, but they, under expectation of Jesus, was what? This Messiah would be the one who would come and conquer, destroy Rome, a Roman, you know, the oppression, and give us political freedom. And they said, this is the right guy, because if he can raise somebody from the dead... He can surely get Romans out of here. Because he has this supernatural power, and we want him to use his supernatural to set us free. They did not want spiritual salvation. They did not want salvation from their sins or cared about it. 
What they wanted was political freedom. They, they had a certain expectation of what that king, a Messiah, would do. But when they saw Jesus riding into town, but he didn't go into the palace, but into a temple, and as we'll see next week, to cleanse the temple, he's like, he's not the king that we want. He's not the king that we expected. We don't want somebody to deal with our sin. We don't want somebody to rule over our hearts. We want somebody who would give us what we want. And what we need right now is political freedom. We are tired of the Romans. We need somebody. We want the Messiah to come and do what we want him to do. And when they were waving their palm branches, it was a, like a national flag. Give us political freedom. We want independence. Restore what kicked the, during the times of King David in all his glory. We want a glorious nation. But they were disappointed by brothers and sisters with Jesus. Because they, Jesus was not what they thought he was. Jesus was not going to give them what they thought Jesus would give. And they were, Jesus was not going to fulfill their dreams and their ambitions and their desires. And he was a different kind of king. So they all went home. And John MacArthur and a lot of other scholars believe that a lot of them, not all of them, obviously, but probably statistically, a significant number of this group will be there on Friday, or it will be there a couple of days later, chanting, crucify him, crucify him. Complete change, a different end than what we expected. Let me share two things. With you. There are plenty of things that we learned from there, but let me share two things that we learned here. First, and that's not the main point. We'll get to the main point a little bit later. First, it shows the worthlessness of being celebrated by men. It shows the worthlessness of being celebrated by men. Pastor Tim Keller says, There's never ever been a more vivid portrait of the fickleness of corporate human nature and of the worthlessness of human celebrity. People were ready to crown him and as king and celebrating, were celebrating him. The next moment, they're like, we don't care, we don't want him. Because he does not meet our expectations. My brother says, if you're honest, most of us long for human approval, don't we? Some say, oh, I don't care what people think of me. But the truth is, we like to be celebrated. And we like to be celebrated by people. We want people to think highly of us. And we go at length to be able. So that's why when people praise us, we fool. We want the approval of our friends. We want the approval of our social group. We want the approval of the people in our church. And we long that. It makes us feel significant. It makes us feel valued. And guess what? When we don't get that approval, we get mad. We get angry. We get sad and upset. When somebody puts us down, we get mad. Because we don't feel approved, we feel disapproved. And we long for that because why do we feel so disappointed? Because we, we, we don't get what we are longing for. But my brother and sister, if you try enough, you might be the few lucky ones who will be celebrated. Not all of us, but many of us could. People look at you, wow, look at you. But you can be sure it will be a temporary and soon you'll be in the trash heap. It's just a matter of time. Human approval, my brother and sister, that we long for goes away like this. And that's why, you know, what we long for, people, I think, the more people will lift you, the higher you are, the lower you would fall. And it's important, especially as young people. You know, when you're in college and school, you want other people. And sometimes we disobey God or we hide God to be able to get the approval of people. But my brothers and sisters, approval or celebration of people is temporary. 
You can do one thing wrong, you can say one thing wrong, you can do that thing, and your opinion would change like this. People who celebrate you will not celebrate you any longer. They might hate you. But how different, my brothers and sisters, is the approval of God that you get. You don't even have to seek approval. He came and he died and he gave himself and he said, I love you. I approve of you. Come to me. And you, I accept you as you are. I've come to die for your sins on the cross. And my brothers and sisters, God never loves, loves you. And then next time, when you disobey him or something throws you in the trash. And he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So don't long for the approval of people. Don't spend your time, your energy to get other people to like you. And my brothers and sisters, most of us, if not all of us, to a different degree, are approval addicts. We want, it makes us feel significant. But long to praise God. Long for the praise of God, not the praise of man. Seek to please God, not man. Okay. Because God will never forsake you. God will never leave you. He's not fickle like us. So that's the first thing we learn. Okay. Seek, live your life to worship God, not worship yourself, not worship other people. Second, and this is the main point in this passage that Mark wants us to ponder. Are you worshiping the real Jesus or the Jesus of your own making? Are you worshiping Jesus of the Bible, who he says he is, and what the Bible says he is, or are you worshiping the Jesus of, on your making? On the surface, this crowd was doing the right thing. They were worshiping Jesus. They were praising Jesus. They were excited and enthusiastic about Jesus. And that's right. That's good. But the problem was they were not worshiping the real Jesus. But they were worshiping Jesus of their own making. They're enthusiastic about not the real Jesus. My brothers and sisters, this is true even in our times, isn't it? It could be tr true for many of us even this morning. We don't really care about Jesus who, who, who would pay for our sins. Okay? We, we're not so much concerned about the nature of our soul. We're not so much concerned about Jesus, why Jesus came, but what he can do for us. We want a Jesus, not who would confront of our sin, but who would say, hey, you're okay. I will give you what you want. He will give us our idols, what we desire, what we want. We get enthusiastic because we're like, man, I need God because I need to, God need to fix my problems. God, I need healing. I need. Now, those are not bad things. But is that the reason you're worshiping God? Don't mistake enthusiasm for real faith. Because you can be enthusiastic about God but not enthusiastic about who God really is. You can be enthusiastic about Jesus, but not for who Jesus is. When we are worshiping God, are we worshiping the God as the Bible reveals it? Or are we worshiping a God of our own making? We want Jesus who will make us feel better, who will fix our problems, who would help us to make our marriage better, or who would bless you know, give good future to our children. Now, God does bless us. But are you, are you excited about Jesus for who Jesus is and what he came to do? Or for what are you excited about Jesus? Or you follow Jesus for what he can do for you? My brothers and sisters, some of us here, and I meet a lot of people who are disappointed with God. Because Jesus did not give them what they thought Jesus would give. And I've heard so many times, what's the point in following God if God didn't even take it? I've been praying for this for such a long, and God did What's even the point of following Jesus? And that's exactly where this crowd was. I mean, what's the point of following Jesus if he's not going to give us the political freedom that we've been longing for such a long time, for generations? 
We want a king that we want. But my brothers and sisters, God doesn't give us the king that we want, but he gives us the king that we need. What they needed was not political freedom. Because even if they had political freedom, what they would do with their freedom is to enslave someone else. I mean, even freedom, which is a great thing, and we, we are blessed to live in a land of freedom, but even if God gives you everything that you desire, and if you die in your sin, nothing was worth it. Think about it. If God gives you everything that you desire, you follow God because if you had everything God gives that you want him to be, and you, you are blessed in what you think his blessings are, but you're not following the real Jesus, you still end up in hell. That the Bible says, what I should profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Even if they had, even if Jesus gave them political freedom, what they really needed was not political freedom, but freedom from the slavery of sin. Because the wrath of God was on them for their sin and on us for our sins. And that's why Jesus came to set us free by dying, by taking our place on the cross and dying the death that we dis deserve. My brothers and sisters, we need to make sure our enthusiasm for Jesus, and we should be, is based on the truth of who Jesus is. Because let's be honest, it's a lot easier to get excited about Jesus of our own making than the real Jesus of the Bible who calls us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross. It's a lot easier to say, hey, Jesus, excited about Jesus who would give us all the things that we want, right? There's, there's a... There's a huge section of Christianity called Prosperity Gospel. Now, you say, oh, none of us will believe that. But honest, the truth is, a lot of us are influenced by it. We may deny theology in our mind, when yet when it comes to it, God does not exist for His glory, but He exists for us. And we get disappointed when we don't get it. True worship will lead to discipleship. True worship will lead to surrender your life to Christ. For, not for your glory, but for his glory. True worship will lead to living your life for the glory of God, not for your own glory. True worship would motivate you to build the kingdom of God, not to use God to build your own kingdom. True worship should lead us to deny ourselves for the sake of the gospel, not to make us more self-centered. And if worship, even this morning, is all about yourself, how you are feeling, it's not true worship. It's a lot easier to draw a crowd with a watered-down gospel, isn't it? Because that's, that's what's happening here. Huge crowd following Jesus because, hey, Jesus will give us what we want. But they are disappointed when Jesus does not give them want and the point of mark is making here and what he wants to do is to examine in our own hearts are you following jesus of your own making or are you following jesus who gave his life for you and who calls to surrender your life to him that he is the lord he's not just your provider not just come who can hear it but he is the lord of your life and this same Jesus, my brothers and sisters, who came riding on a donkey, would one day come in all his glory. He talks about Revelation 19, riding on a horse. Okay, we don't know if it's a literal horse, but the thing is, he's going to be uh, a ruling and reigning king. On that day, it will be too late for you to decide whose side are you on. As the Bible says, the time is now. now. When Jesus comes, when you die, when Jesus comes, and he will come in his all glory, and he will not be coming as a servant, you know, the suffering servant that you see here, that you see in this Passion Week, but he will come as a king in his all glory. And the question for you to ask, are you following Jesus for who Jesus is? Or are you following Jesus so Jesus will give you what you want? 
And my brothers and sisters, if you are here and you're disappointed with God, you're like the crowd. Jesus will fail your expectation because he doesn't exist for us. We exist for his glory. He may not be the king that we always want, but he is the king, and he is the king that we need. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to ask yourself, are you excited about God? Are you enthusiastic about Jesus? If you knew Jesus, you should be enthusiastic. There should be a sense of excitement. But then you need to ask yourself, is your excitement comes from the truth of who Jesus is? Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Christ? Because you want Jesus to give you what you want, your desires, your ambitions, and your excitement with God is more with that? Or is it because you see the glorious Jesus? You see the God of all glory, and you understand that Jesus came and died for your sins, and then you want to live your life for his glory. My brother and sister, even as believers, we can get this confused. We can see, yeah, I'm excited about Jesus. You know, I'm, he's taking I'm on the way to heaven. But what I really need right now is this healing. What I really need right now is my finance. And God is not, and you're frustrated. What I really need now to God to fix my marriage. What I really need right now is this. And when God does not do, we get disappointed. I want you to examine your heart, my brothers and sisters. And would you come before God and say, God, you are the king that we need. You are the Messiah sent from God who died for my sins. And if you're a Christian, would you thank God for God that the glorious king of the universe would come down into this earth and he would die a painful death on the cross. That he would step in your place to die for your sins. The judgment that you deserve on yourself, he took it upon himself. The God of the universe. And he gave his perfect righteousness for you. If you're not a Christian here, my brothers and sisters, Jesus loves you. And he calls you to come to him. He came because each one of us deserved God's wrath for our sin. But Jesus took your place, and he's calling you. He's done everything. But one day, that chance will be over. Jesus has come as your Savior, but one day, he will come as a judge. But your time is now. If you have not accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, if you have not dedicated your life to God, I'm not asking whether you come to a church, but if you're not following Jesus for who he is, would you come and dedicate your life? For some of us, would you come and rededicate your life to God? Let's all talk to God, my brothers and sisters. Let's follow Jesus for who he is. He's the glorious king. He's the king that we need. Let's all pray.